Um, so I'll be talking about, uh, the presentation is called Beyond Screen Readers. And um, what I'm going to be focusing on, and I'll go into more detail, but what I would like to do is kind of take everyone here on a journey um, to look at some of the ways that we can improve our accessibility work beyond this, the uh, base level of expectations that we frequently set. So who am I? Uh, I'm Aaron Marchak. I'm the person giving this presentation. You may have already known that. Um, my Twitter and uh, my D.O. profile are up there. If you have any questions or concerns during this presentation, please tweet or message me. Um, I will be posting the slides later on. There's some resources in here. I will be posting them and tweeting them out. So if you don't write everything down, don't worry about it. And um, I work at My Planet. Uh, we're a uh, enterprise UX firm out of Toronto, Canada. Um, and we, what I do is I specialize in uh, the Drupal practice lead. So I coach and I mentor developers uh, on top of embedding on them on teams as a technical architect uh, to build out projects. And I'm really passionate about my work with accessibility and I hope that I can bring some of this uh, experience that I've had to you. And I almost poured water on my computer. <laughs> it, it, it'd be exciting. Um, cool, so what we'll cover. I'm gonna cover four things here. Um, I'm gonna share some understanding of what inclusive design is. Um, I think that that's a really important uh, idea for us to understand. I'm also gonna share, after that, uh, I'm gonna share some methods for inclusive design and how you can help uh, content managers and designers start thinking about inclusivity. Uh, I'm gonna then g share some uh, techniques, once you've built the site, once you have this beautiful site, techniques for identifying accessibility concerns. And then I'm gonna, gonna show you some code for hard tactics for how you could actually use uh, th this idea in your custom themes. So, I have a timer. We should be on track, it should be okay. Cool. So, uh, the first part, understanding inclusive design. <coughs> Who here has heard of inclusive design before I mentioned it? Could you raise your hand? Okay, great, cool. This is gonna be like super old hat for you, but I'm gonna go through it anyway. Um, so inclusive design, uh, on this slide here, I have I, um, some descriptions that I'm gonna read, and on the right side, I have a graph that I'm gonna describe what's gonna be on there and how it relates to inclusive design. So um, in Toronto, we have a really fantastic uh, Center of Inclusive Design through our OCAD University. And what it does is it focuses on the idea that there is a mismatch between the needs of the, the individual and the environment or the service rent, uh, or product offered. So we encounter the idea of disability when there's a mismatch. And that's really important for us to understand because as the graph on the side illustrates, that mismatch doesn't necessarily have to be how we understand or phrase or frame of our minds on what disability and what accessibility needs are. On the graph, it's uh, images of individuals. Uh, there's discussions about permanent disabilities, temporary disabilities or mismatches, and situational ones. Uh, touch, if you're not able to operate a touch screen, uh, if you're missing an arm, if you have an arm injury, if you're a new parent, or if you're from Canada, you're wearing gloves. Um, <laughs> touch itself uh, is gonna be really difficult, and so you need to make sure you're catering to that. And understanding that this is situational, uh, all the way to permanent, and kind of catering to this broad spectrum of individuals. On the next row, uh, it's called, there's a label of C. Uh, under permanent, it says blind. Under temporary, it's someone with cataracts. And in situational, it's a distracted driver, which is always something that we have a problem with. But you can understand how there's, per, there's a uh, spectrum of ability and a spectrum of uh, needs that need to be met here. Finally, here, um, if you are uh, deaf, if you have an ear infection, or as the situational one is, if, you, if you're a bartender. Um, the other one that we frequently talk about for hearing is if you're at an airport, um, it's frequently hard to hear announcements clearly. That's a really good example. Uh, at the last row, we have speak. So if somebody is um, unable to verbally communicate, uh, if they have laryngitis or a throat problem, uh, or if they have a heavy accent, and I think the illustration is a Viking woman, but I have not figured that out what it is. But the, um, I think what we, when we talk about accessibility and we talk about a lot of the work that we do, a lot of it's framed around the top two, uh, but we don't really, 
delve into and really kind of investigate what's happening when we handle uh, audio or language problems. And I would really like to focus on, not necessarily focus on that, but I'll be really kind of covering that here. Um, and that's especially relevant in terms of the conversational interfaces, the more verbal uh, audio tools that we're using, and how the web is kind of expanding out into Internet of Things. Um, so uh, here, uh, I have the levels of the Web Content Accessibility guides, uh, Guidelines up, and they're broken into three. We have level A or priority one, which is a must have. Uh, it's defined as a web content developer must satisfy this checkpoint. If you cannot satisfy this checkpoint, uh, groups will find it impossible. So when we talk about accessibility, uh, these guidelines that we have here, it, they start at level A. And you really need to uh, focus on making sure that you have a level A baseline for people to access your site. Users will find it impossible. Uh, level double A, or priority two, uh, is should. So we should be striving to this. And this is when, um, if you're doing work and if you're able to invest in budget and time and teams, double A is what we should be striving for because it allows uh, groups, to, uh, without it, groups will find it difficult to access your content. So when talking about accessibility, uh, a lot of the times that we talk about it, we talk about the web content accessibility gui guidelines for priority two. And what I think a lot of people don't understand is what priority three is. And when you look how it's phrased, and this is pulled from uh, the WCAG. So a web content developer may address this checkpoint, which is optional. And as a note underneath on the guidelines, if you, uh, as you follow it, level A should not be a goal that is achievable because it will be impossible for all content to be fully accessible for every individual for across the full spectrum. But it's something we may hit. It's something we may strive for. And when trying to understand accessibility, it's important for us to know that what we're trying to do is make it available for all users, for whatever user agent they're using, whatever browser they're using, and it's the act of trying. It's the act of striving for this idea of perfection, which we acknowledge we'll never hit, um, but we're sh we should be focused in learning and uh, improving ourselves to get, gain that. So I think that that's really important when framing conversations around accessibility, whether you're building it for your, uh, your own tools, whether you're building it for someone else, whether you're talking it in general, is that the idea of trying is so critical and so important. So on top of hitting all of these check marks and hitting all of these guidelines and going through all of the, um, the section 508 and all of the uh, different items that you have within it, the act of doing it starts the conversation and starts the design process. So uh, I'm gonna have a video on here uh, that's pulled from Microsoft's Inclusive Design Series and uh, I found it really relevant uh, for this topic. And I just want to, when watching it, try to see how they, Rosemary describes how she exists within a physical space and how we can map that to a digital space. When I'm in an accessible space without other disabled people using the space, I feel alone. She enters through a revolving door. For me, the best environment that I'm ever in is Washington, D.C. So when you go to Washington, D.C., it's very moving because you're in an accessible public environment, transportation, public spaces, and it's used by a wide, wide range of people with disabilities and other people that use accessible environments. Passengers wait for the metro in D.C. So one of the things that I think is most important about a disability perspective is to make life work, to make things fit between body and world. You change the environment, not the body. You change the environment, not the person. You. So what Rosemary talks about is that at one point, 
when she's in an accessible space with nobody else using it, it's very lonely. It's not this exciting, dynamic, creative environment. Um, and whether that's a physical space um, or a digital space, we need to really respect that as content creators and tool builders. If we're creating one-off um, tools, interfaces, techniques, or digital spaces targeted to individuals with a very specific experience of the world, we're going to be isolating them and we're not going to be bringing them into uh, our content and in our products together as a group. Um, on top of that, we have to understand that uh, we have to be really agnostic for the tool set, what Rosemary calls the body when she talks about the physical space, but how somebody engages your tools and your devices. We need to understand and know that um, even though perhaps I'm designing it on this giant 30 inch screen, there will be people who don't have access to a screen or a large screen or uh, a static screen. And so understanding the different perspectives that users are using your tools uh, allows you to build a more inclusive product that doesn't isolate users. And knowing that and knowing that our goal here today is to build tools, is to build communities, is to bring together people for the web and digital products, is that we need to start building tools with a mindset of inclusive design and a mindset very, very early on in the process. Um, and without bringing people in and uh, including them in the process early on, we're going to be continually always refactoring our work later on to hit some check boxes. We're not actually going to be developing tailored content. We're going to be retrofitting an English castle with a wheelchair ramp in which they still have to go over cobblestones. Like, it's not a great experience and not a lot of people are going to be excited and passionate and uh, engaged with our work. And so the idea of bringing inclusive design into your work, whether you're a designer, developer, or a content manager, is really, really important to do it early on. And how uh, we do it is, I'm going to show you some of the few methods within that. Um, at my planet, we do a lot of user experience design. Um, and a lot of that, we found that the same principles for great user experience echoes out to a great accessible experience. The assuming that an accessible user is going to require different ways of excluding, excuse me, excluding an accessible user or a user that uses assistive tech from experiential design is just excluding them from the space that you're building. So by including groups of users early on, a diverse group of users that use different tool sets, that use different uh, ways of engaging your product is going to really help everyone design, develop, and understand what uh, you need to do to actually meet the needs. So what we do is, uh, at the first point, we do um, user testing. And what we do there is there's, it's a step in the process where we engage users. Either we have a prototype built, or um, it is a more conceptual wireframes at that point, or we do it all the way right before release where we do uh, validation on a fully built product to see if there's any tweaky tweaks that we can make. Um, what UX, UX testing is, is it's pairs of researchers. You can be a UX uh, professional, or if you're just starting off with a small team, there are guides to how to engage and format interviews. But what you need to do is pairs of individuals meet with the actual users and talk to them. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to find assumptions and biases that people bring to the product. And we either, if we're not challenging or catering to those biases and catering to those assumptions, people aren't going to use our product. They're going to hit cognitive dissonance. Um, and the benefit of that is with user experience testing is it's very easy if you already have um, a community around your product, if you already have users, um, you can reach out to underrepresented groups and ask them to participate in it which we found absolutely amazing for building accessible products because the communities that use these tools are so excited to finally participate in the building of it because frequently it's, they're appended as an afterthought. But when you have um, accessible uh, design and inclusive design built in at the beginning, it's much easier for you to kind of accommodate different users. The um, other thing that we do with uh, specifically accessibility uh, user experience design is that um, we ask people to bring their own devices. 
And what that means is uh, they use their own tool sets, both statistic tech and any kind of hardware, to engage with our uh, product and our design. And it allows us to see the exact point in which that user's ability and uh, technological tools that they use uh, to see how that exists. Um, one example was uh, I was doing an interview with an individual and we asked everyone to bring their own computers. And so uh, he sat down, he opened up his computer, his computer couldn't connect to the Wi-Fi, which is like a standard thing when you ask people to bring your own devices. Um, and he asked at that point, could I just do it on my phone because I use that anyway? And it allowed us to identify the fact that not a lot of uh, users that we were targeting actually used a full-on computer like, such as a laptop. They were all on tablets or mobile devices. And you won't know that until you actually talk to users to see how they engage with. We can have um, analytical, analytical data uh, like from Google Analytics or any kind of statistical interface, but you'll never see how that one person chooses to browse in such granularity as with actually talking to them. And that gives you so much more information and insight into uh, how people use your tools. Finally, uh, what we do with this is it's usually a combination of in-person where we ask them to come into a, an office or a common space, uh, or we engage with them remotely either over the phone uh, or with screen share if they are comfortable with the screen share type thing. What that allows us to do is we get the fine-grained detail that we have when you're talking to somebody in person. You can hear the tone and see how they move and see how they can become uncomfortable or really excited when using your product. There's just more detail you can gain from that. Uh, and remote engagement. One, it allows you to access underserved communities much easier. It's just a phone call. And if you're able to connect with your users um, through that, it's much, much easier. Also, uh, specifically with non-sighted users, when you're asking them to access a uh, prototype, you're just over the phone, how they describe the product to you is so informative and interesting. We had um, one interview that was done over the phone, there was no visuals, and the person at one point was just said, uh, the website went away. I was like, is it down? Has our server crashed? And they, they were, the menu went away, I can't get back to the site. Uh, I, and we were frustrated because of this because we thought our prototype went down. They were frustrated because they weren't being able to use it. And it turns out that it's the basic accessibility problem of somebody put a uh, link that opened in a new window. And at no point had, before then had I understood how frustrating and disorienting it was. I knew it uh, academically, but I was just as frustrated as uh, the user was. And to build that empathy in yourself um, you need to actually communicate and talk with people and how they use the product. So it's really, really, really beneficial uh, to engage with users and have these um, UX testing experiences. And because the information that you're gathering is so rich, UX testing is not the same as analytics where you need quantitative data. Uh, this is qualitative. So you can do smaller groups of people. Uh, the sweet spot that we usually try to do is four for each round targeting their individual, uh, individual tool sets and individual assumptions. So it's the barrier to entry for running these testing um, scenarios is really, really small. Finally, in terms of content authoring experiences, once you have built the tool sets, uh, the importance of continuing to train and maintain your accessible work is so, so important. Because you can build, uh, as a developer, you can build this amazingly beautiful, totally compliant site, and then you hand it off to a content team that has never received training. And they'll definitely, not maliciously, but it, it, they will build content and they will make decisions without the context that they need. So in terms of uh, sharing the accessibility initiative and sharing the idea and the pursuit of inclusion, it's really important to make sure that everyone involved in building your tools is trained and understands the goal. Uh, for content authoring, the CK editor has an accessibility checker and there's like a little module, let's see if this works, hey, that you can plug in 
And what this allows you to do is there's, uh, it's not an accessible tool. So if you have users that need guidance for accessibility, the content managers, um, <coughs> this will not be suitable for them. But uh, it guides users through uh, how to audit WYSIWYG content for accessible uh, benefits. Another thing that you can do with this is if you use the uh, Drupal 8 co content authoring defaults, a lot of them out of the gate are really, really accessible and guide your users to uh, understanding it. So we have title and alt text are by default uh, available. And uh, on the link here, the lovely Mike Gifford has a whole article uh, discussing how to use this and how to actually cater to the users. The other thing that you can do, and uh, we actually do this, is have somebody internally to the content authoring team go through the WCAG checklist on the site you should get an external uh, team to audit it, but if that's a barrier for you, again, the idea is striving. So as long as we're going through and we're checking it and maybe every month or so you just audit new content, being like, do we see anything from any automated auditing tools, which I will show in a minute, um, that actually helps people understand where they've made a mistake. And if it's internal to their teams, it's not like it's this big idea or big barrier or big weight of somebody coming in and being like, ugh. I'm gonna get a slap on the wrist. This is something that they can use to strive for. Um, from design tools, on a design perspective, again, training and understanding the different techniques and understanding the guidelines is really important to engage with your uh, designers, whether they're visual or user experience, is really, really important. Um, as an easy thing, I have like literally passively, aggressively posted this on our wall at the office. Um, there is a lovely infographic it is accessibility for designers. And it shows the different things that you can do um, or different things you should consider when building accessibility uh, into your designs. Um, one of the things on here, I do not have it, uh, that I find is really important. Now, this is just a user, user experience concept, but are indicators on your site. Have nothing happen that is not explained or uh, reversible by the user. So when designing tools, if they make a mistake, if they click on a link, you can always go back a step. And that's, um, that is a user experience principle, but it follows the same result, is that you're always able to recover from any error, which is the problem with the blank link, is that there was no indicator of how we got to this page, how the menu went away, or what was going on that was inside the context of the web app. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, if they use Sketch, this is the exciting demo, uh, Sketch has a color contrast analyzer plugin that you can plug in, because it's a plugin. Um, and it's really easy to actually use it. You can see my beautiful design here. So exciting. I highlight my text, and at the bottom, uh, it gives a little screen that it says it's uh, AAA passed for the large text, and it gives you the color contrast ratio. So allowing designers to check their work themselves really speeds up the process once they understand that we need to have color contrast um, concerns. Very few designers intentionally do bad work. I'm gonna say like none, but like I, maybe there's a, there's a guy. Um, and giving people the tools to solve these problems themselves is really getting them engaged in the initiative and allowing them to uh, continue through it. The other thing um, that you can do is they can install CSS Peeper. So as a developer, I saw this and I'm like, this is the web inspector tool. It is. No Dawid. I don't need to talk to you right now. Um, but. <laughs> It allows developers to go through and see the different colors and to see the sites and to understand what the details of the fonts are. So once they understand what's going into the site and understand the color palette, does it have enough contrast and really allow them the tools to engage with the live content you're building, lowers the barrier for their participation. Cool. Um, so those are some methods uh, outside of um, development that you can use to kind of prevent things from happening on your site. Uh, as I said before, I was gonna touch on things that you can do to actually help identify problems when they occur. So, there are two ways to identify um, problems on your site. One is an automated tool. 
From a DevOps perspective, uh, we use the idea of behavioral driven development, which is behavioral tests. And again, this pulls it back to user experience, where there are automated tests that go through user behaviors to make sure that users can click and access different buttons. And it's really easy uh, for you to go through, if you have these automated tests set up, to test workflows. And when you're building these tests, you can assume that they have different uh, access to mouse, keyboard, or different APIs that are available. Beyond that, uh, these are two APIs that do actual accessibility testing. Tenon.io is a third party. Um, you can pass a URL there. Uh, let's see what happens here. And it analyzes your web page. You can push this through an API. Ooh, nine issues. Um, <laughs> so it's fine. Um, so you can push this through a third party API. You're able to hook it up to your Travis tests. Uh, so every time you make a change on the code, it actually gives you this lovely reporting. Now this does do an automated test. So it looks through for any kind of flags, uh, such as this link has no text in it. There's a little error. Uh, and it allows you to um, quickly catch basic compliance concerns beforehand. The issue is that this is a third party, so you do need to be, have access remotely. If you're behind a firewall, I recommend checking out Axe Core, which is very, very similar, but it's self-hosted, so you can run it on a local site if it's behind a firewall or during your dev DevOps process. Um, all the links are in the slides, and I will be tweeting out the slides later, so if you're like, ah, uh, it's okay. Don't be like, ah. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, so those are two kind of like DevOpsy tools that you can look at. Um, I'm gonna call these dev tasks. So these are manual things that you can do to help uh, test your work. Uh, there's two kind of toolbars that we'll use, uh, with the Wave toolbar and the Totali, or whatever, plugin. Um, the other, uh, and I'll be demonstrating those, uh, the DevL Alley module. What this does is it allows logging for some of the APIs in Drupal 8, so you have more explicit logging uh, for the accessibility APIs, uh, do, 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 such as the announcements and the tabbing manager to kind of give insight to people who are not comfortable with perhaps testing using these accessibility tools. So the two toolbars I mentioned, I will be testing on Accessible Media Inc., which is a site that we made. So those nine errors I'm gonna hear about later. Um, and what Accessible Media Inc Incorporated does is they focus on distributing media content uh, to Canadian users in an accessible fashion. So the users on their site use assistive tech uh, to engage with different uh, TV shows, closed captioning, podcasts, news stories, and everything's catered toward their experiences. So, boo, boo, boo. I have my Chrome. There we go. Um, the first one is the Wave toolbar. Nah, I wish the screen was bigger. So what I can do here is I click it, and you can see that it actually gives contextual tool tips for what's going on here. And I can go through and I can step through my site. Um, if you're using content, man like you have content managers that would like to audit their own site for accessibility concerns, I really recommend these toolbars, because they can go through the articles or the content they've created and just kind of see what's going on. Because the benefit of this here is even if it's uh, an error or a feature, you can click for more information and it gives you contextual information based on the guidelines. So while I wouldn't recommend just passing this to somebody without any training or guidance, it's very, very easy to do self-service auditing from it. The other one, Totali, looks a bit better. There it is, it comes up with little, little glasses. And then it goes through and you can see any concerns. So they're, they're a little bit different. Um, I found that Totally doesn't really respect a lot of mobile um, work that you're doing. So if you're hiding and showing content from a mobile versus desktop, uh, Totally kind of catches everything. So it doesn't really use the DOM. And um, the DOM is what the actual assistive tech uses to engage with, um, which is a note that a lot of people, or a, um, a concern that a lot of users used to have and a lot of people with accessibility work said was that you weren't, weren't able to use JavaScript on the web, and the majority of users that we talked to who use assistive tech 
prefer to have these rich internet applications that they can actually engage with. So they want the same UX, they want the same space as everyone else. And right now that there's so many um, assistive technologies that are able to properly parse the DOM that you can use technologies such as Angular and React with accessibility in mind. As long as you're still building those uh, technologies out with the same principles and practices that you would do a static HTML. And I'll actually show how you can do that. Um, so these are two tools that you can just install on Chrome and people can kind of self-serve audit their own work and developers can go through and check at a very basic level. If they're not aware, uh, at, uh, aware of the guidelines at the back of their hand, if they're not super comfortable, these will guide them in ways that they can at least understand and explore their work. <laughs> cool. The other way, which I think is much more important, is manual testing. Because the tools that I showed you parse a static DOM as a machine would. They don't engage and connect with something. Um, they don't use it in the same way that a user would. They're not looking for the same keywords and the same structure that a user would. So manual testing is actually important because despite the fact that a robo robot overlords are definitely gonna come soon, uh, most engage, most things that we're concerned about are people using our tools. It's not the robots and it's not the certification and it's not the Wave toolbar. The Wave toolbar is an indicator for how somebody would actually use the site. It's not an example of how somebody would use the site. So manual testing is the key part of actually making sure that your work is accessible. And that does tie back to the uh, user experience testing is whenever anybody manually steps through something, whenever it's a developer, a user, a content manager, uh, a QA person, a designer, they are testing it as a user would. So it's really important. Um, I've broken it into three large groups. This by no means in encapsulates all the possible ways somebody may engage with your site. But when thinking about manually testing your site, there's kind of three ways you can go, go through with it. Uh, there's sight or any kind of visual um, aspect. There's uh, sound or auditory. Um, and there's touch. Um, beyond uh, that, there's definitely more. But uh, I'm going to show you how you can actually test some of this. Now, how many people here have assistive tech on their computers? Could you raise your hands, please? OK, pretty good. Could you, could you keep your hands up? Um, how many people here have a uh, Apple product? Could you raise your hands to that? How many people here have an Android product? Could you, uh, no, uh, hands up, hands up. <laughs> How many people here have a Windows product? You can't put your hand down. Um, okay, so look, look around. All of these, it was a lot of people. All of these tools already have assistive tech built in. There are um, voiceover for Mac and iOS, including Siri. Um, Android has one built in that you could turn on with, this, with its assistive tech. Windows has a free voiceover application called NDVA that you can install. And these come out of the box, except for Windows, but like that's like Windows. Um, and so what we're able to do is we already have the tools to test this. So again, we're talking about barriers to entry for accessibility testing. Uh, it's still quite low. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna show you how you can actually test this on a Mac. Uh, I don't have Linux, so you can use Google. Um, but you can see how easy it is if you're on a Mac platform. So under system preferences, uh, if you go to system preferences, there's like a little accessibility guy, or gal, <laughs> or gender neutral folk. Um, and you can see here that I have voiceover right here that I can actually turn on. And I'll be showing you how to use voiceover in a second. Um, but in terms of sight, uh, what a lot of people have, um, an easy way to test this is there's a guideline that says no, um, nothing should be indicated by color alone. And so you're like, how do I do that? I always see color. One, hire a developer that doesn't see color. If you can't, use grayscale. You can turn it on and you can see your site actually with grayscale. And you can go through and engage with it and see if there's any problems with it. Um, 
a lot, a lot of the time what this is gonna do is actually tell you a contrast problem. And you're like, well, how do I test if I have a contrast problem? You increase contrast. That's one, of, and these are the settings that users would actually try on your site. The other way you can increase contrast is this. So you can see like most of my interface is not super accessible at this level, but if I increase it up to here, it's pretty legible. Boop, boop. So I'll turn those off. Did you know that this shaky mouse thing? Oh, come on, man. There it is. Actually an accessibility benefit. The other thing that you can do and the other thing that uh, how people engage with your site is if they have low vision, they actually use zooming uh, to engage with your site. If you've ever done the like pinch and view on your phone, the interface is very, very similar. Mm -hmm. So it is option command eight, there we go. And I can start engaging with the site as a zoomed person. And you can see here that it's, if you have very large images or areas without context, I, it's really easy in the same way that any sighted person would use pinch and zoom on a phone, it's really easy to get lost. So always making sure that you have pointers and context on your site. And I, I haven't set up anything special here. I'm not like doing anything wizardry behind the background. I'm just going through and clicking and trying some things. So again, barriers are quite low. Uh, finally, voiceover. A lot of people have like a concern about using voiceover because if you use, if you work with anybody with assistive tech, they usually have it on very loud and very fast and it sounds like terrifying. Um, or if you're near somebody that is testing something with assistive tech, they have voiceover on and it's just like the slowest computer voice for half an hour, like just droning on. Plot twist, uh, if you are testing it as a user, mm -hmm -hmm, you can also click voiceover. And I can turn the audio off. And then I have a little toolbar right here. Chrome busy. Welcome to Mac button muting. Now you don't have to hear the voiceover voice, right? And you can go through, and I can skip to main content, and I can then access different ways to get to my site. And you can see here that it's, the tools that we were using before, such as the toolbars that describe um, different things on the page, it makes way more sense if you're actually doing it manually so you have context. I can see that it's heading level three, how-to videos. I can scroll down. And what I think is really important with uh, manually testing it, na, 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 is that you can actually see points in which you're non-compliant, but it's a better user experience. So I'm just gonna show you one thing that we've done. Um, here we have the digital video guide. Boop, boop, boop. And I, I, I'm just hitting tab, there are different ways to navigate throughout it, but tab is the main one and we're very similar to tab. We have this thing called a combo box. Here, and it says uh, jump to today at noon, go. And if I were to turn on, um, also if you turn on any of these accessibility tools with voiceover on, it's like bad times. Um, so don't, they're not very accessible, which is like ironic. Um, but. Uh, we have here this combo box. We don't use labels properly, so it always gives errors whenever we do audits. But when we tested it with the users and we spoke with users, they said that it's way better for uh, me to understand what's going on here when it's read like the human language. So you can see here that I'm going to, through jump to, and I'm tabbing through our combo box right now. Today, which is collapsed, so I, I know I can choose it, at noon, collapsed, go. And when reading that, as a non-sighted user, it's really, really helpful for me to have this very kind of descriptive human language sentence that isn't constrained by labels. So consistently, we've always had this discussion with the users that they don't want us to follow these guidelines blindly. They want something that is usable for them that is tailored to that. So the importance of manual testing, the importance of user experience uh, design, and the importance of actually talking to users is great. The other thing that we have here as a side note, is if there's a really complicated interface that people are having a lot of problems with, 
we found that if we tweak it one way, one group of users gets confused, and we tweak it the other way, the other group of users gets confused. You just explicitly state it if you're using a keyboard. And we have this here because we have cited users that use the keyboard on our site. And so just describing to them what their expectations should be and how they can use the tools is actually really helpful. Again, this goes back to training. When you actually sit down with somebody and give them the tools that they need to do their job, they're going to be much happier and they're going to do it more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Cool. Sweet. So I talked about some larger testing concepts, and I'm going to go through some individual tactics that we use in our Drupal 8 themes to actually help with different items. So what we do, um, a, a lot of these right now that I'm going to be talking about are focusing on keyboard users and non-sighted users. Um, but some of the things actually do help. When building a custom theme, there is a, we use a lot of um, regions in HTML5, like main and navigation, uh, sidebar, or sorry, a side footer. And we found that unless we explicitly state it, the user just hears like navigation, 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 navigation. Here, I'm just going to turn that on so you can see it. <laughs> so if I go back to the AMI homepage, I'm going to turn on what's called the web router. Of course, I forget it. Of course, a live demo. Anyway. Um, so what accessibility tools do is that they go through and they read the HTML5 regions as main. Um, but what we're doing here is we're adding the ARIA label of content, so when it hits it, it hits main content, which you're like, okay, whatever. When you have three different kinds of navigation, such as a top level navigation and a footer navigation, this starts getting confusing until you actually start describing it as something useful. So when users hit the web router, they can actually target the individual content. Additionally, um, how Drupal renders entities is we always have nodes, and they have like teaser views, and the teaser views are pretty sweet, um, but the Teaser views are always rendered individually. The entities are always rendered in their own context. They're never rendered as the context of the page. So what we frequently have to do um, is give the individual nodes context to what's going on. So we set the heading level dynamically based on where it is on the page. Um, there's a benefit for following the individual um, numeric numbers of the headings, so it's H1s followed by H2s followed by H3, so users can quickly jump between heading levels and they understand when they're nesting into content and nesting out of content. Um, so what we do is we set uh, the heading levels. This is a twig template I have here. I have a variable called H that I'm printing. I set that in the preprocess function, so by the time that I hit the template, we're not doing any kind of funny, ridiculous things in the template. It's very clear for designers to understand. And I'm passing also that heading level as a class uh, onto the actual markup, so then when we target it with our uh, style sheets, it can be an explicitly targeted style. Even though it's a heading level two, uh, we know this should actually be styled as a heading level one. Uh, because visually, the visual patterns of it for users who uh, don't use um, any kind of reader, it's very helpful. Boop. Um, another thing that you can do uh, very, very easily is uh, enable inline form errors. The module is amazing. Um, what it does is it gives very descriptive contextual links when you're completing a form um, and allows you to uh, actually target um, any errors and validation. The only thing is you do have to remove the HTML5 required attribute because NDVA screen readers uh, do not like it in relation to everything else because it only reads like required, 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 um, which you would get if you were testing with a screen reader. We talk a lot about alternative text to image elements. Um, something that we need to realize is as we move forward with uh, the modern web is we're starting to use different elements. The picture element itself um, doesn't properly inherit the alt text 
So the fixture element um, contains a handful of picture sources markup and then an image that is the fallback. If a user is on a modern web design or uh, modern web browser, that image um, fallback is never rendered in the DOM. So they'll never see the alt text. It just looks like empty images. So what we do is uh, we add a visually hidden class explicitly in that element and set that as the alt text. So users who are using modern web technology with assistive tech can actually access that proper alt text. This one's a little more complicated. Um, if you're building learn more text, there's a pattern that is encouraged that you just set more, like the context of that as a span. So if I read more at the bottom of my article and my article is titled like hot dogs are great and at the bottom it would say learn more about hot dogs are great, this hidden text. You don't actually have to do that thanks to the ARIA tags. So what I have here is you can see that I have um, above the learn more text, I have an attribute on my anchor element that says ARIA labeled by and I'm passing it the ID of my link and the ID of my header. And what happens when a user with the screen reader hits that is that the screen reader reads out the content of the first ID and the content of the second ID. So it's read, learn more, Aaron likes hot dogs. Um, but it means that you can have semantic text. It's, you're not hiding and you're not messing with the DOM and you can still have clean, understandable markup. Um, while also catering to users that need more context. And this is much more semantic and it discusses, it shows that there's a relationship between these two elements more so than adding hidden duplicate text. So uh, you can do this a lot. Um, ARIA labeled by doesn't have to be about links. It's a way to build and collect relationships on a page. Cool. So there's some tips. There's some tricks. Um, and I think the most important thing that I want to remind people about building accessible tools is that the, when you hit the um, web content uh, accessibility guidelines, they have a quote by Tim Berners-Lee who's part of it. Um, and it's forefront on the page and I think it's really important for us to understand as people who build tools and content is that the power of the web is in its universality. It is, it should be universally relevant, it should be universally accessible, and people should be able to access it. We're at a software conference for open source software. We, all, you're already interested in helping people gain knowledge and gain access to tools. And to say that we're passionate about how people use software and that we want to keep our uh, community open and inclusive without additionally catering and focusing on the content that we're building and the tools that we're supporting is a real double standard. So when you're building out content, whether or not you, your organization has a strong initiative and a strong reason to build accessible technology, we need to understand that as creators, we are responsible for ensuring that the web is universal, whether it's language, technology, tools. Um, building out that universality is our, like, literally our job. That is my job. I build tools for the web and if the web is, in, is universal and if the web, if its power is the fact that everyone can access it, then I need to make sure that I am not a gatekeeper, that I keep these gates open. So, Understanding that there are tools and techniques and procedures and different processes that you can use is not as important. No, my slide. No, ah, okay. Is not as important as making sure that your teams are diverse from the get-go. Because when you have a diverse group of people building a tool, it's gonna encourage a diverse tool. The Harvard Business Review, um, this article, it gathered a handful of studies and in each study, uh, it verified the fact that if you have a diverse team, people are gonna question their biases more. They had uh, one study where it was a fake jury. One, uh, one group was all white jurors, one group was um, four white and two black. 
And in the all-white jurors, they uh, were given a case to read and they had to determine who the murderer was. Um, the white jurors never questioned the facts as hard as the jurors in a diverse group. When you have a homogeneous group, people make assumptions and people don't rethink those biases. And having people rethink the biases that we're bringing to the tools of the web, having people understand that like perhaps there might be different ways to engage my content is so important early on because you're preventing, con you're preventing conflicts. Nobody's a footnote at the end. But building diverse and inclusive teams is the first step that we have to actually make sure that we're building a universal web. Because if we don't have content creators and tool creators bring their perspectives to it, we're gonna be continually marginalizing groups. So beyond all these tools and techniques, I really wanna emphasize that bring in people, whether it's user experience testing or hiring or just general interviews, feedback forms that are from different groups so you can constantly re-examine the facts and re-examine your biases that you're bringing to the project. Because I know every time I engage with a user interview, I am being shown a new intersection of ability and technology to myself that I will never be able to create. And revealing those biases to me makes me a de better developer. So if you want to start catering to edge cases, catering to unique perspectives, catering to new tool sets, we have this whole world of Internet of Things that already existed. We think that voiceover and Siri and Alexa is this cool new thing, but there's already been people using these for decades. So when building out tools that are for a diverse group of people, we really need to start building out our teams first. And that's, that's it. So, thank you. Yes, questions? Um, so this is in reference to the Axe Core tool that you're talking about. So I've been using the Axe browser extension for a while and I really like it. And I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on one versus the other. Um, as far as I'm aware, Axe Core is a DevOps tool so you can use it during uh, your deploys or your post commit hooks so it's automated. But I mean, other than that, is there any like benefits of it over just the extension? I mean, yeah, I, I, I see like one versus the other and the purpose of like what point you are in testing, but like is the actual testing any different? Um, it's the same as automated testing versus manual testing. If it's automated, it's on a cadence. You know, it happens every time. If there's one person that skips it. Yeah. Um, but if you can manually test it, it's always better because you have that context that you're bringing to it. Okay. But other than that, they, they pretty much catch the same kind of things. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Great presentation. Um, in your user interview slash testing, are you guys finding that users are using the native accessibility functionality opposed to third party software like JAWS, you know, window eyes, zoom text, things of that nature? Um, specifically, it depends on the user and it depends okay. on the context. We found that users with JAWS, because there's such a barrier to entry for JAWS, yeah. um, they tend to stay with JAWS for a very long yeah. time and they yeah. just tend to stay on older tech. Yeah. Um, specifically what we found out that people uh, tended to use JAWS in their computers, and then we're just using the built-in stuff on their phones or uh, t uh, tablets. Um, so people tend to use a lot, uh, and it depends on what the context is. If mm -hmm. your users may have access to JAWS uh, funding, because uh, I know there's assistive programs for them to purchase it, they may use JAWS more than users that don't have access to that kind of funding. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I have a client uh, that is going to need to uh, become 508, Section 508 accessible for the very first time. They do a lot of content updates. What is a good resource where we can both learn more about how they can stay accessible as they update content? Um, if you follow Mike Gifford, who is here, he's amazingly nice. Uh, he does a lot of uh, education and... Um, work within the Drupal community. In addition to that, there are a lot of groups, specifically university groups, that have um, training and documentation on how to build accessibility, accessible tools. I know Stanford has a ton. So what I would recommend is see if you can get somebody who is an accessibility expert in to kind of sit down and show you how to use these tools, give you context, and build that empathy that you need. That would be ideal. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. Um, I'm, I'm at a government agency in uh, Canada, Statistics Canada, and one of the issues we have is uh, 
we tend to work on our projects and then accessibility is kind of an audit step at the end. And then there's a lot of rework, design rework. I know you addressed it kind of in a bit, uh, in a few pieces, but is there any general recommendations you can make uh, how we can get folks, stakeholders at the table earlier so we, we can do less rework? Um, if you have, if the issue is design, train and access your designers, because again, designers are just trying to do the best job with the information they have. They may not understand the concerns with design. Um, and the sketch plugin is a frequently with the design, you can normally tweaky tweaky it and it's okay. Um, but unless it's a color contrast issue, giving designers the tools to kind of audit their own work early on is really helpful. Um, and if it's a tech building concern, the benefit of automated tools, such as these DevOps tools, that you can go through, whether it's not every commit, but it's at least like, maybe once a sprint, you just do a little audit, or once every few sprints, you just do a little audit, and you're like, guys, we kind of suck at this point. How can we adjust um, our code so that it can be catered to it? And educating developers early on is really, really helpful because they're gonna make accessible decisions before it goes to the audit stage, which is gonna be cheaper. So you're basically saying, in your agile sprints, do you build in tickets to address accessibility audits at periodic steps rather than at just at the end, or? It, it depends. Um, on larger projects where we need to have an audit for compliance issues, we build that into the sprint. Um, for other projects where we're not gonna be audited, we encourage developers to make accessible decisions. And I'm really, really lucky in that I work with somebody that uses assistive tech, and so when testing out tools, we literally say, you need to make sure that he's able to use this, otherwise he can't test it and he can't develop it, and it really sucks if somebody on your team, like you, developers feel really bad when they're like, everyone but Everett can use the thing that we're currently building right now. Um, so educating them to make early decisions on by themselves towards an accessible, accessible choice is much, much easier and cheaper. Um, so a little bit of training, uh, DevOps tools to give like that kind of hard kind of slap on the back of the hand or the back of the wrist. If you do a lot of um, stuff with accessibility, uh, then, ooh, I better get out of here soon. Uh, um, then an automated DevOps process is helpful. Uh, is there another person in this room after me? No, oh, there's 50 no. minutes, let's keep going. <laughs> Hi, Sean Heavey, freelancer. My question is about accessibility more broadly and sort of the future of it. I was watching the new Bill Nye show last night and they had on a, a blind man during the, a, the artificial intelligence episode who has an app on his phone that has a deep learning algorithm that can describe things that he's taking pictures of to him. Like, so my question is like, all the stuff we're talking about now is sort of just the kind of things we already do. Are you aware of any sort of emerging technologies in terms of like AI, mobile computing devices, wearables, or like the voice activated assistants that everybody's got now that are really pushing the envelope or stuff that we should be looking more into? Well, I think that when building assistive tech for assistive tech, it's usually done as an afterthought. Mm -hmm. But how we're building out conversational interfaces means that people that have mobility or visual uh, concerns, um, they can actually engage with it. So my humble opinion is that we're actually gonna see a convergence. Because we have so many different ways to engage with a product, mm -hmm. you're gonna be able to choose um, how you engage. So, fingers crossed, accessibility should be built in from the ground up. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, trying out different ways of engaging with the product. Um, the wearable tech is great. Uh, I don't have to have my phone on alert with a sound, I just have a little vibration on me all the mm -hmm. time and I can understand what's going on and I can engage with it directly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Internet of Things, I think, will kind of converge okay. in the singularity for our glorious robot overlords. Mm. Okay, thank you. That was really good. Oh, did anybody drop a phone? Thank you. I'll, I'll bring it to the. You think it'll call mom? <laughs> no, it looks dead. Okay. Yes, sorry. This is probably a tough one. If you know roughly how much it would cost to build a site without paying attention to accessibility, is there any kind of rule of thumb for figuring out how to extra it would cost to build with a high level of accessibility? It depends on the complexity of the site and it depends on the maturity of the developers. Because if the developers can make early accessible decisions early on, then like refactoring the home page is not gonna happen. 
um, or refactoring the menus. Uh, what we do is we usually try to do um, one week of audits at the end and then we estimate based off of that and then we usually prioritize for accessible uh, concerns. Because some of the times uh, if you, if it's always going to be at the end and that's something that you're not able to actually uh, sprinkle through, um, you need to understand how bad it is before you can start estimating. So knowing that you have the audits either in line, like every few sprints, you just have an expert come in and be like, mm, need to tweak this. Um, or it's done at the end and then you can actually prioritize the development of it. Um, it depends on the context of your site. Okay. The end. Hey. Um, I was uh, really thrilled to see you talking about accessibility framing it in terms of user experience because I've been trying to figure out how to think, think that way myself. Um, the tricky thing is when people have questions for me as a developer about uh, how we can make our sites accessible that I can't really give them answers, I can only give them opinions. <laughs> and I'm just trying to figure out if there's any kind of uh, group or network I can go to to discuss different strategy ideas for how to improve user experience. Mm -hmm. um, since there's no simple answer for a lot of questions that I can just look up. Yeah, the, the cool thing about going to these conferences is I have a ton of resources at home um, that uh, I could be like, go to the Inclusive Design Institute and they have a weekly meetup, but <laughs> maybe reaching out to any um, specifically universities uh, or government organizations that would kind of cater to this. Uh, Stanford, Yale, Harvard all have accessibility inclusive design initiatives. Um, start there and try to see if there's a group that you can participate in and reach out to the community. Because, yeah, I can give opinions on things, but until there's somebody that uses this, that is impacted this, that has the perspective that you need, you're only going to be putting yourselves in their shoes and that's not going to get the full um, intersectionality of their perspective, if that makes sense. So reach out to universities, reach out to groups, go on Twitter. Um, there is a great inclusivity and accessibility group on the Drupal Slack. If you want to reach out there, see if anybody is in your region, um, you might be able to find resources through that. Cool, thanks. Cool, thank you.